All right, welcome parishioners to this bonus episode, the final bonus episode for judges. Wow, we finally made it here. Um, okay. Yes, we did. So I wanted to actually start by kind of going and taking a step back and trying to look at how all of this fits in with the rest of the story that we know. Because we covered this when we started Judges, but the timeline for Judges is all over the place. Remember how like when we were reading this section, we were all surprised that Dan didn't have their inheritance yet and stuff like that. We're like, wait, what? What are you talking right. about? So when I looked this up on uh, biblehub.com slash timeline for their little timeline here, uh, yeah. what's interesting is I actually see that that in, so in 1375 BC, which is the same year as Joshua's farewell address before he dies, is where they put the story of Micah. Really? And this whole thing with the Benjamites. Oh, so they put so like the end of there. Judges right, huh. right after that, or almost at the same time. I'm assuming after it. Um, and then we jump to Judges 1. So it's like we do the end of Judges, and then the next year, so 1374, now we're uh, doing Judges like one through eight, which is like Deborah and Barack Obama and uh, Othniel uh, and <laughs> yes, of uh, course. Hebron and Eglon and like all that kind of stuff, right? And then, uh, and then Ruth happens here. So the, the next book okay. that we're going to get to happens, but there's like a big time jump, right? So that I said that was 1374, right? Then we go, Ehud happens in 1316, Deborah and, and Barak are like 1235. Oh, wow. So we, we've Quite jumped jump. forward like more than 100 yeah. years now to get to Deborah. And then Ruth happens 1140. And then 1129 is where we have, we're back to judges with Abimelech trying to become king wow. and that whole business. Uh, yeah. And then we get a little bit of Samuel and then we're back to judges now in 1097, which oh, is okay. like Jephthah and Israel being oppressed by the Philistines. And then Samson chronologically, according to them is the last story, which is 1075. Huh, wow. So that spans Jeez. quite like what? A couple hundred years at least. Yeah, yeah, 1075, and it started in 1406. Goodness. Yeah, so yeah, quite quite a few years. Um, yeah, that's pretty impressive. But what, what made me go down this rabbit hole in the first place, though, was first of all, just realizing how far apart in time some of these stories are from each other, but also um, trying to figure out what happened to the tribe of Benjamin. And what happened when I looked it up is that this time that we read about today is referred to as like a place where the tribe of Benjamin almost became extinct. Huh. Wow. That Okay, yeah. Essentially the way the story is understood is that there were only 600 men from Benjamin left and everyone else was dead. And that was those 600 men hiding in the the rock of whatever it was. And that's why when they got them 400 daughters by killing some other tribe, it wasn't enough. They still needed 200 more. And those are the ones that they went and stole from the other tribes when they came out to dance. Right. Okay. So, so yes. then afterward, the, the reason why I started looking up this timeline is because then it says that the tribe of Benjamin does stay significant because, little spoiler alert, the first king of a united Israel came from the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, uh, well, there you go. Um, really? But oh, wow. the tribe of Benjamin was still at that time known as like the smallest of all the tribes. And it's probably because they almost got wiped out entirely in this story that we just read. Yeah, geez. Yeah. So, so in the timeline, that stuff that we read about Benjamin getting destroyed was like early judges, right? So mm -hmm. that was Israel defeats the Benjamites 1375. And then when we first get our first king is in 1043. So not too long after the Samson story, like, you know, maybe a, a generation or, or two after Samson. So, this, but I guess in theory, enough time to rebuild their numbers a little bit. Well, yeah, that's, we're looking at what, 300 years. So yeah. I'd hope so. Yeah. yeah decent so. chunk of time to recover yeah. in that. Um, but interestingly, the tribe of Benjamin eventually did stop existing as a 
as an individual. Oh, geez, tribe. really? Um, but, but spoilers. This is not going to be in the Bible, as far as I understand. Um, but okay. Basically, the southern uh, kingdom was destroyed in the sixth century BC, and Benjamin, as an organized tribe, just kind of stopped after that. Just stopped, stopped being an organized just, tribe. Just, Jeez. It was like, mm, nah. Yeah. Just dispersed. Yeah. Goodness. Fascinating. Although, uh, also like a little bit of a, not a spoiler, but like a teaser, um, the apostle Paul did identify himself as being from the tribe of Benjamin. So like some people were maybe still keeping track of lineage, but kind of as a united like city, state, country, tribe, whatever it was. Just not so much. Kind of stopped, stopped existing later. Yeah. Wow, yeah. seriously fascinating. Yeah. What do you got? Sure. What do you got? Well, I looked up the numbers situation in the Bible because clearly numbers are kind of a big thing. We we obviously hear like the number seven a lot. That's a very common number in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Apparently, yeah, like four is the number of creation because Earth has four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall, and then the four primary directions. Um, apparently seven is a big number and and spoiler alert 777 is going to be a big number for Jesus? I don't know. This yeah. sounds like some Cuz Jesus loved uh, playing the slot machines. He That's really a, did. So oh that Vegas. triple 7, he's really I don't into know. It. 77, <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. The repetition of 7 is conveyed a lot in the Bible. Um 12 obviously because there's 12 tribes. Um, but then 30 was what happened. Yeah, in they the kept Bible. killing 30 people yeah, in the story. But I guess, I don't know what's significant specifically about the killing that amount of people, but 30 is used as a sign of physical and mental maturity in the Bible. So it just says that it's an age when people are ripe for leadership. I guess men, not, I, not women. Clearly, yeah. I think, I feel yeah. like that's only based on Jesus being 30. Well, he, no, actually, no? this says that Joseph was 30 when he became second in command to Pharaoh after oh. being a prisoner and yeah. a slave, or yeah, as a slave in Egypt. The priests officially started entering service at the age of 30. Okay. Uh, when Moses died, the Israelites mourned him for 30 days. And then far later on, David became king when he was 30 years old. I don't know who that is. No, I've heard of King David, but I don't really know what he does. <laughs> We're going to get there pretty soon, But we'll actually. get there in yeah. Samuel. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, and then, yes, Jesus officially started his ministry at the age of 30. So, and then well, Judas did some stuff for 30 pieces of silver. Well, y'all, <laughs> right, yeah, There's stuff. some spoilers there. Let's not, let's not read too far in that line yeah i mean i know i've i've seen jesus christ superstar okay, okay. all right all right <laughs> okay great musical by the way well done andrew yeah. well done <laughs> lloyd weber for all of you who didn't know that uh, reference. there's as i'm sure you maybe ran across when you were starting to research this there's like so many conspiracy theories around numerology in the bible sure. yeah. so yeah many. i mean i mean i've heard that all over the place like three 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 and like mm. yeah six 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 is the number of like uh, the the beast or i guess well i, I don't know i don't know devil. i feel like yes there do seem to be some important numbers that are clearly important and there's a lot of repetition but then some things i think it's just because like there's so many numbers in the bible especially when you start getting down into using like chapter and verse numbers you yeah. know, that it just becomes very easy for there to be a lot of coincidences. And I think That's it becomes very, very easy to draw connections between things that are not necessarily connected. Yes. However, I would make an argument for it depends how you're looking at it. If you're looking for some like big meta level conspiracy about like, oh, well, this happened in this verse number and they mentioned this number in another story. So clearly there's that like, yeah, I think it's just there's it's a big enough book and there's enough numbers for those coincidences to happen. Mm -hmm. However, we do know that historically, certain numbers have had a lot of significance to different peoples throughout the world. So when like they're specifically mentioning a number a lot, like 30 or 4 or 12 or whatever, I do think that's worth noting almost more as like a thematic thing and seeing if maybe it had some historical meaning. So, you know, there's like kind of two different ways you can look at numbers in the Bible, either from like an ethnographic way of like, what did this number mean to the people who are writing it? Or from the like, you know, tinfoil hat level of, <laughs> you know, what does this predict about how the, the aliens are going to come for us or, or of course. you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so uh, I was curious to look up more about this whole bride snatching game, mm. as it were, and and just the story in general with getting wives for the Benjamites. Where I'm like, it's like, what is this story, and how do people interpret this, and how do people deal with this? Because I this is yet another story that I did not learn in Sunday school, and yeah. was not talked about in church. So I really don't know just like how to parse this and some interesting interpretations for sure i found you know one scholar who points out essentially the irony that like all of this was in reaction to like the horrible thing that these benjamites did to this guy's concubine and then they turn around and do equally horrible things (laughs) to a bunch of other women essentially and so it just being another um example of the fact that israel is just really going to Going to shit, town. essentially, mm, and see. going yeah. to town and going <laughs> yeah. to hell in a handbasket and going to all the bad places and just like spiraling right. down into chaos. Um, yeah. Uh, another interpretation was interesting uh, where this other scholar was saying that he, what he thinks <laughs> is that really like uh, Israel should have just recanted the very foolish oath that they made about not giving their daughters as wives to the Benjamites. Um that this person thinks that it's a lesson in essentially reacting from a place of anger when dealing out justice, you know, mm. um, like mm. this idea they were so angry at the Benjamites that not only did they kill most of them, that then they were like, and we're also not going to give you our daughters for wives. And then later you realize, oh, wait, that's not going to work because then the whole tribe is going to be wiped out, right? you know. And so he thinks that like they should have just found a way to recant that oath instead of then trying to do all these weird things like killing these other people and taking their virgin daughters and then sending off these men to just go snatch some brides that is just kind of more wrongs piled on top of each other and not making a right. Um, Interesting. You know, huh. That's interesting. But if we're just looking at it from what seems to be the values of these people at that time, like you oaths, like there is no way back from that. You can't. It's true. They have that's established true. that that's there's that's not really a way clear. out. There's no way out. <laughs> and and that that's going to be a theme for the whole rest of this book. All the way yeah. all the way through the New Testament of like you basically there's no backsies ever. Uh <laughs> and so <laughs> no take backsies. <laughs> so I still I still like that idea though that the lesson is don't make an oath when you're in an angry place because you might regret it mm-hmm. later. It's true. But yeah. but I I disagree with him in the context of the story that somehow recanting it was an option for them. I right. do agree yeah. that would yeah. be and a better way sense. to do it, but it within, would be a better within way. their world, that's not an option. Yeah, it does seem yeah. to imply that they don't really have an option, a way forward there. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you want to get pissed off, I also Great. found another interpretation oh, generally gosh. about the role of women in just the book of Judges generally. Cool. Um, cool, cool, cool. Which is? Well, okay, so we did kind of touch on this a little bit at the end of the episode about the mixed messages, right? That it's like there's a lot of very strong women in positions of leadership in this book and then also women who are just like treated like crap, you know, and treated like they're nothing. And there's this one interpretation basically saying that like, yeah, a lot of people turn to the book of judges, you know, try to try to make an argument to say that it is okay for women to lead. But I think that it's because the men were weak and not leading. And therefore the women had to step up. And clearly when the women stepped up, society uh, continued to decline. So bad. Yeah. Okay. And it's, Boy. you know, it's a sign that something's wrong. Like the women leading in this book is a sign that something's wrong, that Israel's on the right track. And basically that like the men fail to take the lead, the women step up to do it. They do do a good job but the problem is that then it's so bad that society goes downhill so much that then the women themselves become victims to all kinds of atrocities. And so it's, you know, there's really no winning for the women, no, essentially. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, Whatever. this article was published in 2004, and I just had a feeling that that was going to be the tone. So <laughs> great. Cheers. But great. 2004, I was still in the thick of going to church back then. Wow. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh. Yeah. 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 yeah, I guess yeah. I would have been in college then. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, gosh. All right. Okay. So <laughs> well, that was uh, a lot. I do want everyone to take a moment and enjoy the song one last time. We'll play it, <laughs> play it here at the end. It is for so you. good. Uh, I guess you can always go back and listen to it again if you want. But uh, <laughs> I look forward to picking out some new music appropriate for Ruth. A little one-off, one-off dance party. Any? Do you, do you have any suggestions about what what I should look for 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 Ruth? 
Uh, I have no idea. I, I was like thinking something sweet and ballady, but then I was like, I don't know what Ruth's about. Maybe she's a real bitch. <laughs> Who knows? Actually, I think it's the opposite. I, Ruth, Ruth, the story of Ruth is kind of a love story, I guess. Oh, I don't know. It was well, never my favorite yes. book. I always thought it was maybe a little bit boring, um, hmm. but. I guess something romantic, maybe ballady. I think Emily's on track with something ballady would work. Somehow I became on track. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Okay. All right. We'll see if it's a little bit of a love story. Maybe a little melancholy. Maybe it's kind of a sad story. I don't think it's it a super a triumphant bit. one. Yeah, it is a little bit of a sad story. Ultimately, a happy ending, I think. But mostly, mostly, it's Ruth is held up. The book of Ruth is held up as just like another example of like wonderful Christian godly love. So. Okay. We can go romantic with it. Okay. All right. All right. I'll see what but, I can but find. But chastely. Chastely. Not in like a sexy yeah, way. Yeah. In a romantic, yeah. you know. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. saving the not sexy that music for... porn crap. Yeah. No, I'm saving that for when we get to the Song of Solomon. Yes. Song of Solomon. Then yeah. we can go all out with the saxophones and yeah. anything we want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Well, I can't wait to read the Book of Ruth next week with you. We will see you all there. We'll